Great. Um, <clears throat> thank you um, for the invitation to speak, and thank you all for um, being here. Thank you for coming to D.C. for the March for Life. Um, I grew up in Baltimore, and I live in D.C. now, so I've always kind of taken the March for Life uh, for granted. Um, and so it's always encouraging when you see people flying in, bus loading, uh, coming in from all across America um, to stand for life. Um, as Georgette mentioned, um, some of the work that I do at Heritage has been on assisted suicide. The bulk of the work has been on marriage and religious liberty, and now most recently, gender identity. And so it's always a pleasure for me when I get invited to speak about life, because it's, it's the issue that I care most about, um, but I don't get to spend as much time in my professional life uh, working on it just because of other, um, other demands. Um, and as, as long as I've been cognizant of um, abortion, as long as I can remember um, being aware that this exists, um, I can remember being pro-life. There's just you know, an intuitive sense that something's wrong um, if that unborn baby um, in the womb is, is being killed. And then um, it, was just, it was this time last year that my wife and I publicly announced that we were expecting our first child. And when you see your own child on that ultrasound screen, and then when you know, a couple months later you hold your child for the first time, the, the abortion nightmare becomes that much more unfathomable. Just, you can't understand. Um, you know, so as an intellectual matter, I've always been opposed to it. But once you actually hold your own child, how could anyone uh, be in favor of this? Um, and so it's a great pleasure uh, to get to speak this morning a little bit. Um, Georgette had asked me to speak about the culture of life um, and you know, kind of what I see going on in the culture right now that presents challenges to the pro-life movement, uh, what presents opportunities to the pro-life movement, and just more or less getting a, um, uh, a thermometer, a reading on what's going on, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, and so what I'm gonna try to do uh, this morning is be as realistic as I can be. I think a lot of the talks tomorrow at the various rallies, at the rally at the National Mall, at the various dinners, will be a lot of rah-rah talks. And we need those, right? We need to be encouraged because it's been over 40 years and we still have an overturned row and it's easy to get discouraged. Um, but this probably won't be a rah-rah talk, so I'm just going to forewarn you. It's early in the morning. Everyone might not have had um, your coffee, but this will try to be sober. Um, and so let me just start with what, what do we even mean by um, a culture of life? And it strikes me that a culture of life will be one that respects um, the equal dignity of every human life. Uh, and I want to highlight both of those two words, equal and dignity. Um, and the first part, the, the, or the second part, the dignity part, is that our dignity is intrinsic. Um, it's not instrumental. Uh, that's a philosopher's distinction, which more or less gets at we're valuable because of who we are, not what we can do. Um, we're valuable um, based on our intrinsic worth, not our instrumental um, worth to other people. Um, you know, what we can do for them, what we can do for the economy, what we can do for the government, what we can do for our families. Um, our, our, our worth is um, intrinsic. And it's something that's equal, right? The equality that we have, it's not that we're all equally beautiful or we're all equally talented or we're all equally intelligent. Uh, it's that we all have an equal claim to dignity, um, that we all have equality in dignity and worth, um, not ability and productivity. And now you can argue for these things, and I've spent a fair bit of my professional life arguing for these things on the basis of philosophy and science. Um, you, you can uh, appeal to natural law philosophy in particular. Um, one of my co-authors is Robbie George at Princeton University. My first job after graduating college uh, was as his research assistant on a book that he wrote titled Embryo, A Defense of Human Life. Um, this was maybe 15 or so years ago, back when the big debate taking place in D.C. was over embryo-destructive stem cell research. Uh, you know, we forget how quickly... Um, things have progressed. But when George W. Bush was in the White House, the big criticism was that Republicans were waging a war on science because they wouldn't destroy embryonic human beings in the hope for cures. Um, and so Robbie's a professor of philosophy at Princeton, and, and the book defends this just on the basis of science and philosophy. Um, and I think it's persuasive. I think God has created us so that our intellect can know certain truths, including certain truths about the natural law. There's a law written on our heart uh, and we can avail ourselves of these things. That said, um, how persuasive is the natural law if you don't believe in the natural law giver? Um, how long can you sustain a culture of life 
um, as that culture becomes more and more um, secular. And not just secular in kind of a neutral sense, but outright hostile to traditional religion, particularly orthodox forms of Christianity. Uh, it strikes me that one of the big challenges, even though the public opinion looks good when you look at millennials, when you look at uh, opinions on abortion um, specifically, one of the big challenges will be what's uh, been referred to as the rise of the nuns, um, not the Roman Catholic little sisters, um, but the people with no religious affiliation. Uh, when they check none on what is your religious identity, your religious practice, um, I just don't know how long you can sustain a pro-life movement, sustain a culture of life uh, when you don't have that theological grounding. Um, because the, the theological, to go beyond the natural law, grace builds on nature, grace perfects nature. The theological grounding is that each and every one of us is made in the image and likeness of God and that God died for each and every one of us. If you lose that conviction, it's, it's much harder to see why we should care about each and every life. Um, irrespective of their talents, of their abilities, of um, what they can do for us, what they offer to us, when we see that each and every one is simply a gift, right? um, what we can do for them. That's certainly how I've, um, my son is now a little over five months old, and my wife and I, we've welcomed him as a gift. He doesn't do all that much for us. Um, unless you can somehow sell soiled diapers, we would be, we would be rather rich right now. But you, you receive this as something, we didn't do this. Right? We didn't make this life, but we received this great blessing. Um, and we sacrifice for him. Um, what happens when a culture loses uh, that sensibility? All right, so the next thing I want to mention, uh, we do have some cause for celebration, though. Um, the abortion rate is down again. Uh, if you look at the CDC just reported numbers for 2015, there's always a, a, a time lag. Um, and not all of the states report, uh, which is why the CDC number is a little bit lower than probably what the actual abortion rate is. Um, but the most recent numbers show a 2% drop in abortions. And it's been pretty consistent. Um, at one point, there were over a million reported abortions a year in the United States. Um, the most recent CDC number is um, 638,000. That's 638,000 too many, um, but we've cut in half, roughly, uh, the numbers of abortions that were taking place at the peak. Uh, it was uh, sometime around the 1980s. Uh, Roe v. Wade is decided in 73, abortion steadily rises to the 80s, and then it's been steadily declining. Um, and that's the work of pro-lifers like you, uh, changing hearts and minds, um, doing the cultural work at crisis pregnancy centers, doing the legal work, and I'm going to mention that in a minute, uh, what's going on at the states in particular. Um, Pro-life laws save babies, uh, and it's important to remember that. Um, uh, Planned Parenthood and, and the Guttmacher Institute will try to tell you otherwise, but the reason they're so opposed to pro-life laws is that they actually make a difference. That said, um, I fear that the official CDC statistic um, is artificially low because of new technology uh, for the abortionists. Um, abortion pills, uh, not just the morning after pill, but now you can have a week after pill. Um, these are the things that got Hobby Lobby and the other pro-life uh, businesses and nonprofits in trouble with the Obama administration because they didn't want to pay for these pills that can kill very early unborn children. Um, and telemedicine. Uh, Planned Parenthood is uh, increasingly uh, prescribing these pills without actually doing a consultation. And it's not clear um, if these abortions are being captured in the CDC data. Uh, and so we're, um, we're, 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 we're aborting children through a different method. Um, and so it may actually make those numbers slightly higher. Um, but still, we've had 59 million abortions since Roe. We've had over 600,000 abortions last year. Um, those numbers are tragic. Uh, and there's still much work to be done. Public opinion seems to be going in our way and there are two new polls out just this week. So originally in my outline, I had some outdated public opinion polls. And so yesterday I updated it. There's, there's a Marist poll that the Knights of Columbus um, support and there's a poll that um, Students for Life have conducted. And so the Marist poll, which I believe it came out on Tuesday, um, it shows that 75% of Americans 
um, say that they would limit abortion to just the first trimester. Um, that means 75% of Americans disagree with Nancy Pelosi and disagree with the Supreme Court. Um, and they might not even realize it. Um, so that's the opportunity here, right? We have an opportunity of uh, the American people are more pro-life than either our Supreme Court or our Congress. Right? And so that's also a challenge of how do you communicate to the American people that we're one of only seven nations um, that allows late-term abortions. Right? And we're in the company of, of North Korea and China and other human rights violators. Um, otherwise, um, the rest of the nation, the rest, I mean, the rest of the world doesn't allow late-term abortions. We do. And the vast majority of American people are against that. Even self-identified pro-choice people and registered Democrats are against that. So the Marist poll showed that 60% of people who say they're pro-choice favor laws that would limit abortion to the first trimester, right? They're not abortion radicals who say, you know, up to and including the moment of while you're delivering, right? They don't support partial birth abortion. They don't support born alive abortion where you born, uh, give birth to a child and just leave it there uh, to die. They don't support um, late-term abortions, but their political leaders have been captured by the abortion lobby. And so the challenge is how do you drive that wedge? How do you help communicate to more people that our laws are out of step with the global community and with our own uh, American public opinion? Uh, the Student for Life poll put out um, showed similar statistics. It shows that 70% uh, of millennials um, support those same um, abortion restrictions and that quote, only 7% of millennials had the same position on abortion as the Democratic Party's platform. It's a very small percentage that actually agrees uh, with any, uh, that everything that the abortion lobby is demanding. That said, um, I sometimes fear, and almost all of the things that I'm gonna say, it's gonna be some good stuff and then some that said stuff, just so you get an idea of uh, the structure of this. I sometimes fear that these public opinion polls overinflate um, our support based upon how they're asked. Um, that the wording of the public opinion polls and that people are very inconsistent in how they answer these polls. So they could say on the one hand, I'm in favor of laws that would protect unborn children and say, I'm in favor of laws that allow a woman to decide what to do with her body, right? And at the end of the day, those, those, as a legal matter, those two things obviously conflict. But as a sentimental, you know, what are you in favor of when you're talking to a pollster? Oh, I'm in favor of both of those things, right? And so I think we could end up seeing uh, both sides claiming that the polls uh, support them. Um, so it's a caveat. Abortion regs. Um, here's another, uh, and by regs, I mean regulations, laws that have been passed. Here's another cause for great uh, celebration. Um, I took some data from the Guttmacher Institute. This is the Planned Parenthood research arm. And they show that between 1983 and 2010, the average number of pro-life state laws enacted each year was 15. Right? So for um, 30 years, 80s, 90s, and then the first decade of the 2000s, about 15 pro-life laws were passed each year. But during the past decade, 57 uh, state-level pro-life laws uh, on average were enacted each year. Uh, last year, it was 60 uh, pro-life laws that were enacted. Um, and then there was a paper just put out showing that the states that had the most um, women representatives were the ones that passed the most pro-life laws. Um, so you, you, you frequently hear the left talk about this saying, oh, well, how could you be a woman in favor of, of abortion? This is why they're so scared of Amy Coney Barrett as a potential Supreme Court nominee who's pro-life. It actually shows that women, and we know this through the public opinion, is that women are more pro-life than men, and women legislators seem to be more aggressive, or at least they get things done, uh, because the states that have more women legislators are the ones that have passed uh, more pro-life laws. So wonderful. I just read about this, um, maybe it was last week at National Review, a post that Michael New has written. And if you're not familiar with Michael New, uh, he's a professor at uh, Catholic University, so uh, right here in DC. Uh, and he's done some of the best research showing that the pro-life laws are what are, re are, are contributing to the reduction in abortions. Um, that it's not just that people are having less sex, although that's part of it. It's not just 
um, that people are choosing to carry more uh, pregnancies to term voluntarily, although that's also part of it. It's also that pro-life laws are deterring people uh, from aborting their children uh, and that we can see, and he's documented um, uh, um, the states that have passed those laws, how their abortion rates have changed. Um, and so th this is something to encourage us as we continue doing work in our home states um, to try to pass um, uh, as protective laws as possible. And then the challenge becomes, what will the new Supreme Court do? Uh, Anthony Kennedy is gone. Uh, Brett Kavanaugh is now on the court. Um, it's just a matter of time until they take either a, a fetal selection abortion bill. And by that, I mean something like Indiana, uh, which recently passed a law saying you can't abort a child simply because um, she's a girl or simply because he has Down syndrome. Um, that this is eugenic abortion and we can at least pass laws that prevent eugenics. So that's gonna be something that eventually the Supreme Court weighs, is, weighs in on. And, and my guess would be that uh, with Kennedy being replaced by uh, Kavanaugh, uh, they'll be more friendly to these pro-life laws. That that's a net gain uh, on the pro-life side. I also think eventually one of the 20-week bills reaches uh, the Supreme Court. Can you protect a child at the point at which the child can feel pain? Right? Um, after that, I think we keep backing it up. It'll be a heartbeat bill. Can you protect a child at the point at which the child's heart is beating? And then we back it up again. Can you protect the child once the child is living? Conception, right? Um, my, my sense is that we won't see the Supreme Court uh, in one fell swoop overturn Roe v. Wade, uh, especially with Chief Justice John Roberts. Uh, he's going to be more incremental. Uh, that's my sense of how this will likely go. And so it'll be uh, this state law is upheld. And that means the state law could be upheld in all 50 states. And then we back up a little bit more a couple years later, and this state law is upheld. And that means it can be upheld in all 50 states. And then eventually we get all the way to our goal of protecting all children at all moments in their lives. There are also some frustrations to report um, on, the, on the legal side. Um, Planned Parenthood is still receiving a lot of our tax money. Um, and for two years, um, the party that uh, professes to be pro-life, occupied the House of Representatives and the Senate, and had a president who said he would sign a bill defunding uh, Planned Parenthood into law. Um, and they never actually got this done. Um, they've shut down the government over a border wall. They weren't willing to shut down the government over killing babies. And so it does show you where the priorities lie um, and what is uh, something that is a good applause line, a good campaign line, something that we'll talk about versus uh, something that we're willing to sacrifice for uh, politically. Um, I'll probably stop with that during Q&A. We could chat more. Um, but it's just frustrating in the sense that um, if they couldn't get something done in the past two years, what's the prospect for the next two years? Right? And where, when will uh, the stars align where you have a pro-life uh, party in both houses of Congress and in the White House? Uh, we could be waiting a while before we see you know, those three things lined up. And with, uh, right now, um, relatively uh, sympathetic courts. Uh, all of, it's not just the two Supreme Court justices that Trump has appointed, but almost all of his circuit and district court judges have been outstanding. And the district court judges are the ones that first hear these cases, and then it goes up to the circuit, then it goes up to the Supreme Court. Um, you're gonna be seeing opinions that say, I'm bound by Supreme Court precedent that says X but we should really reconsider that precedent because it's not quite right. You're gonna be seeing uh, ways in which, or you'll see opinions saying this is the Supreme Court precedent and it doesn't speak to this issue. The Supreme Court precedent says uh, a woman has a right um, to an abortion. It doesn't say that she has a right to kill her child because she's a girl or because um, um, uh, uh, the child has Down syndrome. Right? We're gonna be able to see uh, creative ways in which um, judges will be able to carve out more space for pro-lifers. All right, let me move uh, from the public opinion and the, and the public policy to some other cultural um, um, considerations. The past couple of years has also been when we've seen both the Charlie Gard and the Alfie Evans cases. Uh, and I think both of these provide both opportunities and challenges. Um, because what we saw in those cases were um, Medical elites 
um, the gatekeepers saying that this life, in essence, was unworthy of life. Um, that's what the bottom line judgment was. They said that further treatment was futile, um, but not because the treatment itself wouldn't bring benefit, but because the fear was that if the treatment did bring benefit, it would prolong a suffering life. Um, that as you dug into these cases, it was really fascinating to see why won't they let the parents take the child to the Vatican hospital, right? Uh, the Pope had arranged, look, if, 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 if they won't treat you in the United Kingdom, bring the baby to us and we will treat him. And the UK government said no, right? They're like, no, we want to make sure this child dies, right? And, and there's something very uh, perverse about that uh, because it wasn't saying that we think that the treatment won't work or we think that the treatment will harm the child. It was that we think that if the treatment is successful, the child's life will continue in a diminished state. Um, Charlie Camosi, a professor at Fordham University, has written a couple of good essays uh, on both of those cases showing what was really going on. Um, because the way the media wanted to say was, oh, the treatment is futile or the treatment uh, will harm the child. Um, but if the medical experts were right, they said that the child was already brain dead and the child couldn't feel pain. So how could the treatment have hardened the child, right? There was something inconsistent what they were really trying to say is that there are certain lives that have such a low quality of life um, that they're better off not living. Um, and we've seen this not just in cases like um, uh, Charlie Gard and Alfie Evans, um, but in countries like Iceland, where they've eradicated Down syndrome um, by killing all of the people who have Down syndrome. Right? They, they, they haven't uh, cured a genetic uh, um, uh, defect uh, preventing trisomy from uh, being passed on to the next generation, what they've done is they've just eliminated everyone that has uh, uh, trisomy. And so the challenge here, I think that most, um, I think most people recoiled in horror when they saw the parents of Char Charlie Gard and Alfie Evans not being able to do anything for their children. Um, that if you yourself are a parent, and you picture what would I be doing if that was my child? Um, and I don't think anyone really sided with the UK government. Right? They, they sided with the Pope. You know, I'd be getting my child on that helicopter on that plane and flying him over to Rome. Um, and so I think there's a chance here to um, pass some parental rights laws um, and other things that would respect the authority of parents to decide what's in the best medical interest for their child rather than the ethicist at the hospital or uh, the government expert. Um, that, that actually protecting that the people who can care best for their children are the people who have been caring for that child and have the natural God-given um, authority to care for that child. The Charlie Gard cases, um, cases like that are in, um, interesting contrast to um, current biotechnologies that are trying to uh, create children um, to be um, immune to certain diseases. So whereas we, on the one hand, we will um, abort children with Down syndromes, we, we will uh, deny care to um, young children who have um, certain diseases. The flip side is here, we could create designer babies um, that would be resistant to certain um, uh, uh, health challenges, or at least that's the current justification. Um, so the headline uh, from two months ago was at the uh, was right around the time of Thanksgiving, so the end of November, and then it carried into the beginning of December, was that a Chinese doctor had created two genetically modified children um, to make them resistant to HIV. And of course, that would be the initial, look, all we're trying to do is to modify the embryo to have a, an immunity to be resistant to a certain disease. But of course, that same technology will also be the technology that could create designer babies, uh, babies that have um, um, enhanced capabilities. Um, so the technology is called CRISPR, um, and it's a way of gene editing. Um, and they've, they've used it in adults, so if you have um, a genetic um, disease, there are ways in which they can um, do a gene therapy um, editing your, your genome, but then it stops with you, right? It, it, if, they, if they change your genome as an adult, it 
doesn't get passed on to future generations. What just took place was that they edited um, two embryos at the embryonic stage. And so this will also influence their germline, uh, meaning that their own gametes, their sperm, their eggs, will carry the same genetic edit. And then their children and their children. Uh, so it's not just that they've changed the genome in one individual, but they've now changed it in a way that will impact all subsequent generations. And they have no idea what any of the potential side effects are. I mean, this is entirely experimental. Um, and so this new biotechnology of CRISPR, it raises um, new forms of some of the old questions that we were having back during the George W. Bush years about embryo destructive research, about cloning. Um, a lot of the topics that were being um, discussed 15 years ago are all of a sudden kind of front burner central questions. Um, questions about experimentation on non-consenting minors. Um, none of these embryos consented to be genetically modified. Questions about human embryo destruction. Um, question about the creation of life in a laboratory. Uh, questions about designer babies um, enhancing life. Question about what is that boundary between therapy, you know, repairing harm, uh, um, therapeutic interventions, and then enhancement interventions. Where do we, how do we draw a line between those things? And then also questions about passing this on to future generations. This is the first time when we've edited the germline. Uh, and so let me say a couple of things about this because I think this is one of those newer challenges. Um, the first is that like all um, so-called assisted reproductive technologies, um, many more embryos are created than are ever actually brought to life. Um, so the first concern with something like CRISPR, um, with various forms of surrogacy, with various forms of cloning, is that they create many embryos, but they only want one or two live birth children. So the rest of the embryos, they either perpetually freeze or they simply destroy. Right? Very few are the women who want to be Octomom. Uh, you remember the lady who had... Um, IVF and they implanted maybe 12 embryos and then eight of them uh, were successfully brought to term. Most women don't want to be Octomom. They want to have one, maybe two live births. And that means all the other embryos are either being destroyed right away or they're just being frozen, uh, you know, like a, a rainy day fund. Well, if we need more embryos, at least we have them cryopreserved. Uh, this is an affront to human dignity. Uh, this is a challenge for a culture of life, to be so kind of callous in how we view the very first days of life. Uh, each and every one of us was once a one cell zygote. Each and every one of us was once an eight cell blastocyst. Um, that's just a stage of human life. Um, and our, um, our general attitude right now is that, well, these are somehow less than fully human um, because they don't look like walking, talking adults, right? We're privileging the adult stage of life and um, we're privileging kind of the healthy bodied um, autonomous adult stage of life. Right? That's kind of the, this is what it really means to be human and to have dignity and value. Um, and then anything else on either side, right? For people who are too old or too disabled or too cognitively impaired or people who are too young or too immature or too disabled themselves are somehow lesser than. And we're seeing that attitude right in the lab. And so regardless of where someone might stand on the abortion debate, right, maybe someone says, well, in the case of abortion, it's you know, a crisis pregnancy or there's a competing concern, the life of the mother versus... Here, you're creating embryos with an eye simply to destroying them. Right? Uh, it's not one of these conflict situations that um, uh, uh, pro-choice advocates will frequently kind of appeal to. It is simply ab abnitio you're going to create more embryos than you need so that you can pick the best embryos to implant and then destroy the rest. And that's how they talk about it. They will actually grade the embryos of which ones look healthiest, most likely um, to survive. So that's one challenge here. Um, the second challenge is that as pro-lifers, we should care not just about not killing life, but we should also care about how life is passed on, how life is uh, procreated. Um, life should be begotten, not made, um, to borrow from the creed. Um, there's a great danger in creating children in the laboratory, um, a process that treats human subjects 
as if they're objects of technological mastery. Right? There's a big difference between um, fertility and procreation within the sacrament of marriage and then the sterile manufacture of human beings in a laboratory. Right? How do we view these children? Do we view them as gifts or do we view them as um, things that we can produce? Where we're the producer and they're the product. Where we're the manufacturer and they're the uh, manufactured. There was a um, great quote that I came across uh, when I was working for um, Professor George um, from the chairman of George W. Bush's uh, Bioethics Council, and uh, Leon Cass. Uh, Professor Cass, he's not a Christian, but he's a humanist, and um, he, he can see uh, many of the same things that we see um, on the basis of natural law, just looking at that law written on the heart. And he was doing an interview with um, Christianity Today magazine, and they asked him about some of the challenges of cloning, some of the challenges of designer babies. And this is what he said. It stuck with me ever since. He said, as bad as it might be to destroy a creature made in God's image, it might be very much worse to be creating them after images of one's own. I'll say it again, yeah, because it's, 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 it's a long quote, and it, you have to catch each word. He says, as bad as it might be to destroy a creature made in God's image, it might be very much worse to be creating them after images of one's own. Okay. And so there's a challenge there of how will we even view how we transmit life to the next generation? Um, and, and, and how does that idea of that we're begotten, not made, um, uh, the creed, obviously, it's about the second person of the Trinity, but the same concept uh, would be passed on to how humans, how beings made in the image and likeness of God are to be begotten. The last thing I'll say here is that um, it's not surprising to me that the first um, country where this has taken place is uh, China. Um, I don't think China has... Um, particular concerns for some of the bioethical um, uh, truths, uh, ethical truths that we share in this room. There also have been rumors of um, using technologies like this to create super soldiers, uh, people with larger lung capacity, people with uh, um, greater height, greater weight, greater musculature. Um, this technology this time was deployed for what seems to be a noble purpose. Uh, um, preventing the transmission of HIV. But you could see how this very same technology fallen into the wrong hands could be used for very uh, perverse ends, um, creating designer babies um, uh, uh, not to benefit them, but to benefit us. And so a challenge here would be how do we convince um, how do we convince our neighbors that just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something? Um, the nature of science is frequently pushing boundaries. It's making new discoveries. It's gaining greater and greater um, powers. And how do we push the brakes? Uh, how do we set limits? Um, how do we enforce those limits? Um, who will lead on those issues? Um, I, I don't see great appetite, unfortunately, in, in this city or DC, I guess technically we're the city over, but, but I don't see great appetite in DC to even be having these discussions. Um, they'd rather just ignore them because they saw how controversial they were back when George W. Bush did lead on these issues. Right? There was a bioethics commission that Bush established. Um, actually, it was, it, was, it was held over. Um, Clinton had started a bioethics commission um, because the former president of Princeton uh, was his chairman, and then when Bush comes in, uh, Leon Cass is the chair. Uh, and it's largely just kind of silently fallen away. Bioethics aren't a front page issue any longer. Um, and that doesn't mean that the bioethical challenges don't exist anymore. It just means that we're ignoring them. We're not talking about them. And the scientists are doing uh, what the scientists want to do. All right, let me say a couple other uh, aspects of the culture. Um, I think we're um, seeing a challenge for us in the foster care and adoption domain. Um, so moving from some of the bioethics challenges to um, foster care and adoption, um, 
the number of children in foster care and waiting to be adopted had been falling up until five years ago. Uh, and so now for the fifth consecutive year, uh, we've seen both the number of children in foster care and the number of children waiting to be adopted um, grow. Um, and so uh, it had been declining from 2008 to 2012. It got as low as uh, 396,000 children uh, were in foster care. Um, last year, it was 443,000 children. Um, so it's gone up roughly by 50,000 children. Um, partly this is because of the opioid uh, epidemic. Uh, there are many uh, families unable to care for their children, and so their children um, are, are being um, cared for by Child Protective Services and then by foster families and hopefully by adoption. Um, in 2012, there were 100,000 children waiting to be adopted. Um, not every foster child needs to be adopted. Sometimes you'll go into foster care with the hope to being reunited with your uh, parents uh, once they've worked through whatever it is they need to work through. So Child Protective Services can kind of guarantee that going back to home is a safe option. That's about three quarters of the children in foster care have that situation. But one quarter of them have a situation of they need to be adopted. And so there were 100,000 children waiting to be adopted in 2012. And in 2017, the number was 123,000 children. Um, this is a challenge for the pro-life community because ideally that number would be zero. Um, we would be stepping up and um, adopting all of the children waiting to be adopted. Um, and I'll mention, I'll, I'll highlight it now, but one of the challenges there is that um, many of our faith-based adoption agencies are being shut down by the government uh, because they won't violate their beliefs that a child deserves both a mother and a father. Uh, and so it's a very tricky situation of how do we help more children who need to be adopted find forever families while the government is um, uh, attacking the very agencies that do some of the best work at finding those children, those forever families. Uh, and it's a tough situation to be in. Moving on from um, adoption and, fo and foster care, um, the CDC just reported, um, I think it was last month, that we've now reached a 30-year low for fertility in the United States. And that only two states, um, South Dakota and Utah, have at least replacement level fertility. So 48 of the states aren't even um, uh, replacing themselves. Their populations, native born population, it's declining. 30-year um, low. Um, and America is better than most of the Western European countries. Um, some of those countries are literally teetering on a demographic collapse uh, where uh, you'll see that their uh, fertility rates are like 1.3. And you need 2.1 just to keep a stable population. And so one, uh, several generations of 1.3, um, and you see your population uh, declining, declining, declining. George Weigel once remarked that the average European millennial uh, will have no firsthand experience of what a brother or a sister, an aunt or an uncle, a niece or a nephew or a cousin is. Um, because if you're an only child and your parents are only children and you only have one child, there's not that web of connection. They want family trees and they keep branching out and out and out. If you have three or four kids and then they have three or four kids and their their aunts and uncles, their nieces, their nephews, their cousins, it's a large family tree. Whereas here you see a tree that keeps narrowing. Right? Husband and wife have one child. Marry someone else has one child. Marry someone has one child. Um, there's a question of how you can um, uh, um, uh, continue a culture of life where the culture has lost confidence in itself, even to the point of not, um, not begetting life. What is happening um, that we don't see um, population growth? We don't even see population stability. Uh, why is it that we have a 30-year low for fertility in the United States? And it's not just that we have the challenge at the beginning of life. Um, we're now seeing, um, uh, for the first time in a non um, depression, non-wartime, um, our life expectancy has been dropping for the past three years in a row. Uh, so the CDC also reports um, that uh, whereas life expectancy more or less since the end of the Great Depression and the end of the Second World War had constantly been going up, 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 for the past three years, our life expectancy has been declining. And it's particularly stark uh, for white males. 
um, their, their life expectancy is going down. And the reason why um, is what two professors, two economics professors at uh, Princeton have um, described as deaths of despair. Um, the suicide rate is rapidly growing. Uh, some of those deaths of despairs are accidental, uh, opioid overdoses uh, and, and, and things like that. Some of them are intentional. Uh, people who just don't feel like they have um, a reason to live. They don't have the wherewithal to get through whatever it is they're struggling with. Um, and so it also draws to my mind a question of how can you have a culture of life um, where both the fertility rates rapidly declining and now life expectancy is declining. And the cause of that life expectancy decline isn't that there's a famine or there's a plague, it's deaths of despair. Uh, and, 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 and so one of the opportunities here is how does the church minister in this situation? Uh, when you think that we're the ones uh, who ultimately have a message of true hope, uh, of true purpose, of true meaning, um, uh, it strikes me that there's a huge opportunity. Uh, Jordan Peterson has tapped in on this to a certain extent, but not quite with the right message um, because Peterson um, isn't explicitly Christian. I don't even know if he is personally or privately Christian. He doesn't want to talk about um, his faith commitments, um, but he's tapped into something where people are, they're looking for meaning in their lives. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the gospel story is the true story about meaning and pur purpose uh, and our ultimate origins and our ultimate destiny. And so there's an opportunity here. Um, the last thing I'll say, and I've um, um, gotten um, the sign that I need to wrap up, is that we're going to have um, a huge challenge um, now with assisted suicide. Right? So we're seeing rise in suicide as a result of deaths of despairs and things like that. But we've also now seen for the past five years, one by one by one, a new state each year legalizing assisted suicide. Um, and so this started uh, with Brittany Maynard, kind of the most recent big push, uh, celebrity media push for assisted suicide was Brittany Maynard's um, suicide. And um, that got California um, to legalize assisted suicide back in 2015, Colorado voted to legalize assisted suicide in 2016. The District of Columbia voted to legalize assisted suicide in 2017. And then Hawaii voted to legalize assisted suicide last year in 2018. And so it's been about one jurisdiction uh, per year now for the past four or five years. Um, and it's not just that this will undermine a culture of life, although it will do that. This denies the equal human dignity of every life because it says certain lives are eligible for a doctor's assistance in killing them, that they're not worthy of the law's legal protection that says you cannot kill. Um, so there's that, which is bad, but it'll also it'll undermine a culture of sound medicine. Um, how will the medical community, the medical practice, and the financing of healthcare change when doctors have the option of either healing their patients or killing their patients? Um, we already have healthcare problems in our country uh, especially the financing of healthcare. It's a lot cheaper to give a lethal dosage of barbiturates than it is to do another round of chemotherapy or radiation or hospice care or nursing home care. Um, the more cost-effective solution will frequently be um, the assisted suicide option. Many people feel pressured into taking their lives, either by medical professionals or by families. Right, so one of the other things that this would undermine is not just the culture of life, the dignity of life, but a culture of familial support. Uh, there was a great essay written by a Lutheran um, ethicist, Gil Mylander, about 20 years ago in the, in the journal First Things. It was titled, I Want to Burden My Loved Ones. And he was intentionally saying, look, everyone's, oh, I don't want to be a burden. And he's like, no, the entire point of family and community is that we burden one another and we shoulder one another's burdens. And he says, look, my children burdened me when they were young <laughs> and I'm gonna burden them when I get old. And that's the point of life. And so one of the problems with assisted suicide laws is they say, oh, no, 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 we're not supposed to burden each other. When we're no longer autonomous, when we're no longer fully self uh, kind of sufficient, then it's the time uh, to exit. Right? And this is gonna be a big problem our success in defeating these laws, and, and I should say about 20 to 25 of these laws are introduced every year and only one passes. Um, so to highlight the positive, we defeat these in the vast majority of places and we defeat them on a bipartisan basis. Uh, Ted Kennedy's widow 
was the lead spokesperson against assisted suicide in Massachusetts when they voted on it in the 2012 election. And she said that assisted suicide undermined her husband's legacy because it said that some lives were unworthy of quality, affordable medical care. Uh, we've been able to partner with um, both the left and the right, Democrats and Republicans, disability rights activists. There's a great group that you should get to know, Not Dead Yet. Um, and their entire point is just because I have a disability, just because I have a disease, it doesn't mean that I'm dead. And it doesn't mean that I deserve less legal protection than you.